Heights. Fire. <laughs> Episode 86. How exciting, right? So many termite things. So many things. First, we'll start off, what am I drinking? Well, this is from a bar in uh, Omaha. Now, I was working in Council Bluffs, Iowa, but right across the river is Omaha. So if you people from the coast where you don't know where any of that is anyway, it doesn't really matter. But no. technically, I was working in Iowa, but technically staying in downtown Omaha. Uh, greatest new hotel I've ever found in 15 years called the Far Farnham. Farnham? Farnham. 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 Yeah. Wow, was it awesome. They're smart elevators, like in New York, for Midwest people, we were the first time I ever saw an elevator where I punch in my number and then it tells you what elevator car to go to. So if right. I'm on 17, it'll go E, but I didn't even know what was going on when I saw that 10 years ago. Now, this one, you just put your key card under there and it tells you what floor to go to and you jump in that car. Then you don't have to wait on all the other floors. Oh my God. Yeah, but it's just super nice. And there, anyway, there was a bar around the corner <laughs> called Billy Frogs and I actually paid for this. I did not steal it. Billy Frogs. And yeah, I bought two of them. I don't even know why. Maybe it was a fun bar. And that's where we were talking. And this is this brewery was right down the street. Omaha's Brickway Brickway Brewery. Very hard to say three times quickly. And I picked up a little vo vodka there too. There's so much alcohol in this house. So seriously, like if something really goes down. <laughs> well, my sister always makes fun of it. Why do you have all this alcohol for? And then during um, COVID, I'm like, see, that's why we have an alcohol room. <laughs> that's why... Popular. You may have a room with a bunch of kids' crap. I have an alcohol room. Um, anyway, that beer is really good. It's a fun little brewery. I didn't really have time to get to that because I was very Billy, busy at Billy Frogs asking the locals about Warren Buffett. Oh, no. The consensus is he's cheap. And then one guy goes, yeah, but that's why he has $125 billion and we don't. I'm like, well, <laughs> point taken from the end of the bar. <laughs> But then we went to his house. It is in, yes, it's a fancy older subdivision like the homes. Remind me of Clayton in St. Louis. They're brick and they're they're big, but they're nothing ostentatious. I mean, they're really pretty. Ex they're expensive, but his is right there. Turn the corner. Was that in the video? The yeah, the the video. The video. Yeah. yeah, it. And I drove right up. And then I think my brother told me he didn't even want to get that fence. Which is totally hoppable, by the way. I mean, it's right. not like a big deal. And he didn't want to get a private jet, but the board made him do it. But even that fence, and then like you go around the corner from his house, and there's just a normal, regular ranch, two-car garage. Like, it is, it couldn't be more normal. But then I also said to <laughs> the opening act, I go, I'm sure in back in the day they were concerned about Warren maybe getting kidnapped because right. he's worth $125 billion dollars. But he's 91, and I, I, nobody wants to kidnap a 91-year-old. No, Trust me. Work. No, it's too much work. I don't want to be involved. And then you got to keep them awake. You know they're going to sleep a lot at 91. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're ever in Omaha, just Google his address, comes right up, and you can just drive through the subdivision. There was a regular truck, not even brand new, just a truck, white truck right. in the driveway. I didn't see Warren. Did the house wait? looks – It looks. I did wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I saw the McDonald's he goes to every day. They All the people in Omaha have encountered him right. many, many a time. They said he's nice, quiet. Well, he seems, if you ever watch that movie about him, no. oh, it was great. It explains a lot. Wow. I mean, I think he's on a spectrum. He doesn't do well with he change and routine. And I say that having family members on the spectrum, so I'm not making fun of that. But he likes ritual and routine and and numbers and that's his that's his gig that's what he likes. Oh, he's good at it. He's very good at it. Maybe if I liked it that much, I'd be good at it too, and I wouldn't have messed up on my um my Moderna booster. I had to do the thing three times. I made a mistake three times on that thing. I'm like, I can't fucking follow directions. Like, there's nothing wrong with me. I just want to get this shot and get out of here. <laughs> you have a thyroid condition? No, I, oh. I circled yes instead of no, and I don't even have. Then they don't believe you. Then they look no. at you like, oh, right. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at all the questions on the form for the booster. And, you know, there's like, oh, there's probably like 20 things of do you have, do you have. My parents have all of them. Oh. Like I circle just no, no, I circle the whole column. They, at this point, almost have to circle yes, yes to a whole right. column. Mm -hmm. Have you had a heart attack? Yes. Have you had cancer? Yes. Have you had this? Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, 
So the show, this weekend, two shows at a casino in Iowa, very, very fun crowds, and a couple termites sent me some things backstage. Um, this is from Ashley, Cinnamon Toast. You guys should know this exists. Cinnamon Crunch Popcorn. Toast. Cinnamon Toast Popcorn. Popcorn, yeah. I'm not going to open this because I'm sending it directly to my tax baby nephew, Kevin, who's addicted to all Cinnamon Toast things, and he'll love it. And uh, But I do appreciate it, and he will absolutely love it. So I don't want to nice. open it. Because I'm going to pop it in the mail in between times before I see him. Mm-hmm. Again, um, this this one made me laugh. This came backstage. It's called Dorothy Lynch. It Sarah looks said. like a job. I, I know. My friend Sarah said get it. It's It looks like a giant bottle of French dressing. This, so like, weird, this, so term, this termite Kathy wrote, this is somehow Nebraska's do ranch dorothy lynch made it made in lincoln nebraska personally i don't care for it but might have enough zest for you thanks for all the work thanks for the podcast enjoy your visit where the cows and farmers are both slow and the steaks are good thank you kathy termite i'm gonna try it here's the thing it doesn't even have a controlled top it just it comes right out like it looks like french dressing no no i mean there's not like a a, a spout it's just dump it on, pour it out like a dump truck. I know, it's see who Yeah. Oh, gosh, it lasts forever, too. Shake well, refrigerate. And it has um, 100 calories for two tablespoons. Well, that's not too bad for dressing. I think they had it at the, uh, at the spaghetti place. Oh, I went to the old spaghetti works in downtown Omaha. If you ever go the old market, it's called... That place is unbelievable. For like nine dollars, you get this salad bar that's attached. Well, it's built into an old timey truck. I saw your video. Well, it's very Midwest iceberg lettuce only. I like it. Yeah, it's better than French dressing. Mm Mhm. It's good. Tang, sugary, excellent. Um, (laughs) But so you order your pasta. And then you pick what topping. Uh-huh. Like, I just wanted basil and something. And then I ate it, and she's like, are you ready for seconds? <laughs> of pasta? <laughs> no. My God. How much are people eating? Are the and then the lady next to me, <laughs> she ordered beer cheese topping, a marinara with meat sauce, and the one I got, the basil one, uh-huh. but it was all in one bowl. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. If, if you've crossed the Midwest line, even I can't cross one. <laughs> No, no. Come on, guys. Let's get a handle on things. But it's great if you have kids. It's, and it's a fun place to go in. Um, it looks cool. After you're done visiting Warren Buffett's house, may I recommend, <laughs> recommend the old, old spaghetti downtown in the market? Um, this is Farmer's Bootleg Homestead Ranch. This is from Granger, Iowa. Yeah. And this is Ashley, the lady who brought the popcorn. Yeah, there were a lot of termites at the show in Iowa because they had their shirts on and stuff. I could see it. They don't know I can see them, but I can see them. I just wandered out to the casino. Nobody even saw me standing there. Mm. It's good, but there's better. Oh, You know what it tastes like? It's got dill in it, I bet. It's good, and it's different. You like tang, though. I do like tang. But it's gluten free, so I'll give it to my sister. Great. She'll be so happy she can have a ranch. No MSG, do right. I believe? No high fructose corn syrup. Well, then that's why I don't like right. it. Exactly. You don't have the thing that'll kill me in it. <laughs> yeah, that's that. We'll put the popcorn over here. It's done. We will send that to Kevin Madigan, and then everybody should know Dolly's thing is out. I did not have time to bake a cake. I don't even know how. Truth be told, I mean I can follow the instructions, but. This is Southern Style Banana uh, Cake Mix. Oh, it sounds delicious. It's Dolly's. It's out everywhere now. Banana pudding cake. This is the frost. This is the frosting. It's, I already tasted it. It's so good. <laughs> oh, my God. This is creamy buttercream frosting. And then I didn't open the chocolate one because I'm going to give it to my mom. But they have it in chocolate, it's too. Hard to find. It's very hard to find, but it's supposed to be in all grocery stores. I think people are buying it all. Yeah. Quickly. Yes, and I don't have any aside from, well, this is the power that I think Dolly has. Where's Dolly at? Um, Taco Bell is bringing back 
the Mexican pizza. Ah! Big announcement. The beloved, and she's the one who said maybe they could bring it back. Maybe they heard her. She loves it. Right? The beloved menu item will permanently reappear on menus beginning May 19th, the chain confirmed. They eliminated it in 2020 as part of a broader culling of its menus during the height of the pandemic that helped the fast food chains shed complexities and costs. The Mexican pizza consists of a tortilla shell filled with either beans or ground beef. Well, if you're in the Midwest, why not all of that? A pizza yeah. sauce and is topped with another tortilla shell that's smothered with more sauce. Taco Bell introduced it in 1985, originally called the Piazza, Piazza, Piazza Pizza. Oh. Yeah. Oh, here, wow. Removing it are outraged Taco Bell fans. One petition uh, gathered nearly 200,000 signatures of pissed off people. Oh. Particularly were outraged were Indian Americans who saw the menu item as one of the few fun vegetarian options. Why are Indian... Ma- do they mean American Indians or do they mean people from India Indians? I don't know. Who's a vegan? I don't know. There's wouldn't there be all kinds of things to talk about you could make vegan? Just with beans and rice and cheese? How do they count? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a vegan. I don't know what the rules You're are, but seems to me like you could make something there without it. Um Mexican pizza costs four ninety nine. And members of Taco Bell's loyalty program can order it two days before the reintroduction. You you can get two days ahead of it. If you're but somebody better tell Dolly. She said it was her favorite. And, and then she she gets she was on the Today Show. Um, she likes the heart the soft. She gets the soft shell. She likes the others, but they fall apart so badly, especially if you're riding around. True that because sometimes after a show, yeah. if we're gonna drive to the next town. Sure, I'd love a hard shell taco, but I can't deal with that shit all over my lap. It doesn't do good in a car or a bus or whatever. Um, She opts for the taco supreme with sour cream and all that in a a soft shell. She prefers mild sauce because she doesn't like to get it too hot and ruin everything. She gets a side of rice and and beans. So there you go. So I don't know if it was because of Dolly or she might have been the icing on the cake. No pun intended since we have icing. Was there anything else that happened in Iowa? I went to the baby ray gun store, the motherships in Des Moines, and it, everything everything in there is smart and funny. Well, not everything. There's some dumb shit in there, but a lot of it is super smart and super funny. Um, and said that, and since the the Florida don't say gay thing, they have a whole section of say gay just to <laughs> just to piss people off. Say I think. Gay. I don't know. There was something else I took a picture of, though. Oh, I think it was that they have a whole ranch shirt thing. It's just a fun little store, I'm telling you, if you're in Des Moines or Omaha. You got to uh, talk about the, uh, the videos of the steak being there. Well, if you go on my Instagram, you'll see a video of this, this oven thing where they cook steaks. And the way this, I could have sat there all night because I'm a pyromaniac mm-hmm. and drank wine and just watched the fire. I didn't even order a steak. I'd already ordered a Caesar salad. And I don't know, it was too <laughs> late at night to be eating all that steak. But... Mm-hmm. Somebody was eating it because they were just piling it on there. It was fascinating. Watch the video on Instagram. It's just like the way she cranks this wheel, the grill goes up, and then they throw, throw more coal and logs or whatever back there to keep that fire going. Nice. Anyway, moving on. Update. <gasps> I know this is shocking, but the Maryland man who had 124 snakes at his house that was found dead, uh-huh. turns out, of a snake bite. What? Yeah. Well, eventually that's going to happen. Right. 46 years old, he died of snake envenomation, the Maryland Health Department confirmed. They also confirmed it was accidental. Well, right. If you right. have 124 snakes and you paid for them and you're sitting there feeding them, I'll bet you he was feeding them. That's not mm-hmm. <laughs> Listen to the, some of the poisonous ones he had. He had rattlesnakes, cobras, black mambas, oh, God. and a 14-foot-long Burmese python. The snakes included venomous and non-venomous varieties. They entered his home on January 19th after they received a call from a concerned neighbor. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The scene. You know, I people and you know what? I'm sorry, I don't want to I don't want to live next to this guy. No. That has to be disclosed. And what if you have kids? Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. If you have kids, and what if like in Texas, the Grand Prairie one, they never did find that cobra. I'm not gonna let a dog out, even the cats. Right. Because they'll go fuck with it. I mean, they'll hit it. 
you know, and yeah, you should, you should have to disclose that if you're buying a house near that. Um, that's just a, oh my God, this is so funny. Okay. Well, I have to read this off my phone. Termites, do we remember last week when we talked about, in an update, the Capitol rioter who stole the liquor and he was convicted and he was, I don't even remember what I read was his penalty was, but he's, he's in the trouble box mm-hmm. and he's also running for Congress. Well, I'm not going to say where I got this, but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> that man, his name is Jason Riddle. He emailed, uh, in a roundabout way to get a message to my friend, Ron Tater Salad White. I don't think I can get in trouble for reading this. <laughs> People, I can't believe that I read this last week about some person I've never met who, who was a part of the riot, uh-huh. drank the wine. Uh-huh. Remember the wine? Oh, yeah. Hi, my name is Jason Riddle. I Googled on how to contact Ron White, and this is the email that came up. I was at the riot and just got sentenced for raiding the Senate's parliamentary liquor cabinet. It's the actual guy. I've been using the publicity to run for Congress up here in New Hampshire. Anyways, I'm pretty sure I like being a smart ass on camera more than I care about being a politician. Just looking for some advice from the best there is. Why didn't he ask me? <laughs> this is the kind of well. shit Ron gets. P.S. I might have said you finally caught the tater while I was in booking. Oh, well, he was in jail when he was getting booked in jail. You find, oh, he's call, doing a callback to Ron's oh, joke. Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> who, who writes? I was at the riot and just got. Uh, yeah. America. He writes like I would think he would write. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he can't spell the most. <laughs> we have another update on another rioter. <laughs> We're moving on. Mm-hmm. I don't know what Ron is going to do with that. I d- let's no, I'm not putting somebody's email in the show. Well, I, I mean, he's if he's stupid enough to send it, I get to read it. He but that I don't, it. I'm not going to harass. Unless he's, if he starts running for Congress and he emails me, I don't know why I get all these political goddamn <laughs> from both parties, too. Like, you don't even know which way I vote. Come on. Vote for me. U.S. Capitol Ryer, who said he believed he was following Trump's order, guilty on all charges. Oh. He said... This is an important one, though, because he's using Donald as his excuse, saying he told me to. And if that's, that, that's going to be a precedent-setting thing, because then the rest of them, but it didn't work. He claimed he was following presidential orders when he stormed the U.S. Capitol and stole liquor in a coat rack. It was, he was convicted on all charges. Dustin, Dustin Thompson, a 38-year-old exterminator from Ohio, faced six charges uh, obstructing an official proceeding, Theft of government property, illegally entering the Capitol, illegally protesting the Capitol, and two counts of disorderly conduct mm-hmm. in, ca- in the Capitol. Okay. After the verdict, federal, uh, federal Judge we- uh, Reggie Walton blasted, oh, he blasted Trump's conduct. The insurgency was in effect, was in effect that is very troubling. I think our democracy, we don't need to read all that, it's just, it's just him pontificating, but um, <laughs> this, wow. guy, this guy said, he said, uh, Thompson's lawyer told the jury Trump was an evil and sinister man who has incited the, the riot with his incendiary in speech at, um, in D.C. where he told his supporters to march to the Capitol and fight like hell. He did tell them that. He did. What does that mean, though? Right. Eh, that could mean do actually hit people. I mean, I, especially as a Libra, I would be like, can I get some clarification on fight like hell? Do you mean like just verbally? Should I punch somebody? What, what, what exactly do you have in mind? And then I'll make a decision. Thompson testified that he believed he was acting on the behest of Trump. Besides being ordered by the president to go to the Capitol, I don't know what I was thinking, Thompson told the jury. I was just caught up in the moment. Sorry. Here's the thing, though. Some of those people that went there to protest, absolutely fine. Absolutely can do that. But when it came time to scale the walls of the Capitol, which was so stupid because the steps were available, they just wanted the drama, I think. But a lot of people just went home. A lot of people just went home. That was an option. And you picked the wrong way. Um, 
Prosecutors ridiculed this idea, arguing Thompson is an adult capable of making his own decisions and told the jury that Trump was not a one on trial. Um, one jury, one juror told CNN that the jurors only considered whether Thompson was a willing participant, which he was. They were judging the case on its merits. I don't think anyone thought about Donald Trump, even though clearly a lot of people have feelings. Um, and then it says impact on future cases because they're all going to try to say he made me do it and it just didn't fly with this judge. Maybe it'll fly with a different judge. But I don't know. You're in a lot of trouble, Dustin. Good luck. <laughs> I hope your exterminating company gave you a raise to get you out of all this trouble. Um, update! Oh, my God. Two of the very sneaky villagers. The old turtles that live in the villages. Not all, not, not all that super old, but these two are 65. They, um, they, they admitted and they pled guilty to voting twice. Oh. Yes. And it wasn't twice for Biden. No. <laughs> this is what they have to do, though. I love the punishment. I love it. Two men for the village is a Florida retirement community known for its staunch support of former President Donald Trump. Yeah, but there was a lot of Biden people down there, too. Anyway, You're probably more of them for me and more, more Trumpies, but that's fine. Uh, they've pleaded guilty to voting more than once during the 2020 election. Charles Barnes, age 64, and Jay Ketik, 63, have admitted per court documents from Sumner County, Florida, to casting more than one vote. This is a form of voter fraud, a third-degree felony, which carries a maximum prison up for up to two years. Boom. <laughs> that's a long time. Yeah. Just because you wanted to get a double vote in. Right. Mm-hmm. And it didn't even help. These two have signed a pretrial intervention contract, which allows them, having admitted their guilt, to have further prosecution deferred for 18 months as long as they abide by a series of requirements. The re requirements um, include mandates that Barnes and Keksik, I can't say his name, Complete, they have to do 50 hours of community service and not consume illegal drugs. Oh. Yeah, I saw their picture. They don't look like it. No, <laughs> I don't think. I thought it was going to say alcohol. I'm like, whoa, oh, my <laughs> God. In addition, the two must attend 12-week adult civics class based on the textbook, We the People, the Citizen, and the Constitution, and pass the class with at least a C-. Oh, I love it. Love it. <laughs> I don't know if I could pass it now. These two might, they should be worried. They agreed to the first step in rehabilitation is to the admission of wrongdoing. If they violate the terms and the case is returned to the court's docket, this document should be admission of guilt, blah, blah, blah. There's still two more out there they haven't got. There were four. <laughs> I just want to see them sitting in a constitution class. I mean, I should probably go take it myself. I probably don't have this shit in there either, but I passed it. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. It, it is hard. Yeah. That's what all the new people in this country have to pass. And I don't even think the the anybody that wants citizenship, and I don't even think probably I would bet 75% of our citizens can't pass it. Maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah. paddles in the constitution. Yeah. <laughs> Rowing our way through legalese. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> Update! I have so many updates this week. Some weeks there's just none. And then other weeks, oh my God, they, they just they, I can't keep up on my phone on the road. I'm like, save it, save it, save it. <laughs> this is the highest fine ever for a passenger on an airplane. Federal Ad Aviation Administration has proposed um, an $82,000 fine against an airline passenger who allegedly disrupted a flight last year. Regular says on April 8th that that was the highest penalty ever imposed under its zero tolerance policy for what it calls unruly behavior. Speaking of unruly behavior, um, I saw a fight that started on Southwest mm -hmm. and ended in baggage claim with a guy, older man, mid-50s, throwing a 21-year-old, uh, ish, 20-ish, maybe 18, just pushing her down the escalator. What? Yep. Why? I, I, they got to fight. Well, she was standing too close to him in his mind. She was crowding him, but obviously there was no need for anything. I'm just saying this is a crazy shit. Then flying back to Nashville, the day I was flying back, a dude shot himself in baggage claim by accident. What? I mean, <laughs> oh my God. Everybody's crazy. 
he's not dead, so it's laughable. I guess, I don't know, the gun must have been in his pants. He shot himself in the leg. But, I mean, there's a shooting in baggage claim, and now it's just morons shooting themselves. <laughs> Probably went to pick somebody up, thought, I better take my gun. Just in case. Forgot it was loaded, and then he's standing there. Who knows? Um, that, it's still wacky out there if you're thinking about traveling. That's all I'm pointing out, that shit is not normal. Do you, uh, this was, uh, um, if you're on an airplane, don't be a jerk and don't endanger the flight crews and fellow passengers. If you do, you'll be fined by the FAA, U.S. Transportation. Oh, Pete Buttigieg. I forget he's in charge of that. Oh, right. The fine was levied on a passenger who was, this is the lady who got duct taped. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She was traveling from Dallas uh, to Charlotte uh, in July of 2021. She threatened to hurt the flight attendant that offered her to help the passenger after she fell into the aisle. The passenger then pushed the flight attendant aside and tried to open the cabin door. Two flight attendants tried. This is why we need a cop and a mini prison. I don't know why we can't make that a jail. Yeah. Yes. There's a cop and there's an area the size of the toilet. We'll even put bars on it so they can see out. The drunk people won't think it's funny. <laughs> the southwest lights of vegas there'd be like 18 people on the sides of a toilet move over get back there um after the passenger was restrained in flex cuffs she spit at headbutted and bit and tried to kick the crew and other passengers Come on. yeah oh my God. she was arrested after the event i hope so the faa also provide oh, proposed a seventy-seven thousand filer against the delta airlines customer traveling from vegas to atlanta that passenger attempted to hug and kiss the passenger seated next to her. Oh my God. Okay, that's weird. That I even I've never even seen that. Somebody just tries to start making out with you. You're like, hey, hey, hey. She walked to the front of the aircraft trying to exit during the flight, refused to turn return to her seat, and bit another passenger multiple times. The two proposed fines are the largest ever against two pas- passengers for allegedly unruly behavior. It is levied, the FAA says they've levied approximately $2 million in fines since the government's zero-tolerance policy took effect 2021. Uh, that's a whole other fight for a different day in a bar. Well, I had to wear them at uh, Kansas City. Last weekend. Kansas City? Mm-hmm. Kansas City got a national Oh, well, out. yeah. And it's weird because I wouldn't think they were. But anyway, everybody wants to fight about that too. Update! Remember we talk about Japan's monkey queen? Uh-huh. Termites, do you remember that? She made it through mating season with her uh, rain intact. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> the reign of Japan's monkey queen has just begun. Now, see, why didn't somebody read bedtime stories like this to me rather than fairy tales, and I don't believe a goddamn word of it? That would be awesome. Yeah, when, this is a great bedtime story. <laughs> Last year, Yaki... A nine-year-old female Japanese uh, macaw fought several other macaws, including her own mother, to become the alpha of her troop. She kicked her mother's ass. Yep. That made Yaki the first known female troop leader in the history of the Takaseyama Natural Zoological Garden in southern Japan, which was established in 1952 and is home to over a thousand monkeys. A thousand! She's the queen of. Wow. During her first... Breeding season as queen, which will begin in November and concluded, in, which began in November and concluded in March, a messy love tri- triangle threatened to weaken her grip on power, according to the officials at the park. The macaw that, am I saying that right? M a c a q u e, macaw, macaw, Maca- I don't know. Q u e, q, whatever. Um, the monkey that Yaki showed interested in mating with a 15-year-old male named Goro rejected her advances despite the, them coupling during a previous breeding season. Meanwhile, an 18-year-old monkey named Luffy did his best to woo her, yeah. much to her displeasure. It's, it's, uh, it's macaque, right? Macaque. Yeah. Is macaw a bird? Yeah. Whatever, I'm saying monkey. Yeah, but aren't there birds that are macaws? Macaw is a yeah, yeah. Macaw. whatever. This is what we learned that I wasn't taught to read properly in grade school. Um, anyway, Japanese monkeys are, uh, uh, they were worried that Yaki would not be able to maintain her status while pursuing and rejecting potential mates. Tensions run high during breeding season and a challenge 
from a sperm male could easily rob Yaki, an average-sized female, out of her rank. She rose to power by defeating the truth's alpha male. But he was elderly and less formidable than the average young male. So she took out an old monkey, a dude, and her mother. This lady ain't kidding around. No. No. No, she won. Fortunately for Yaki, no other monkeys attempted to usurp her throne, and the queen remained the troops alpha until the end of March, according to reserve officials. Her continued rule has surprised scientists and given them the opportunity to observe how monkey, the monkey society for func- functions under a matriarchy. Despite having to maintain her supremacy, she had a successful breeding season. After Goro gave her the sh- cold shoulder, she spent many weeks playing the field. Oh my God. <laughs> she did that with sex every day. Wow. Expressing interest in no fewer than five wow. males. Yeah. Among those males was Chris. Just wow. Chris. A male ranked 10th in the troop. And she, Kawa, who holds the rank as 15th. Maru isn't ranked very high at all. But staff members say he's quite the catch. He's very calm and kind to baby monkeys. <laughs> Isn't this, this a wonderful bedtime story? Another, uh, uh, as a mother, this might be important to Yaki. Yeah, I want you to be nice to our kids. Yeah, how about you not smack them in the face? Uh-huh. I've seen monkeys do that. No. Oh, That's she gave birth so to weird. twins, which is rare for the Japanese monkeys. One of her babies went missing and is presumed to have died. Uh-huh. Oh. But she continues to care for the other one. Oh. I don't know. They just were born in March, so. How old is she? It doesn't say. Although a mature Yaki fought with her own mother to rise in status, she is generous and kind to her baby. It seems that she held on to power without much fuss. The only changes in rank occurred when the monkey that held the number three spot went missing and all the monkeys below him moved up one. That was an exciting day, I'm sure, once they decided he was officially gone. Um, then it's just all this stuff about monkeys. We don't, we don't need to know it all, but we just it's just another th- it's That's just crazy. She made it. Yeah. They didn't think she was going to make it. And she made it. Okay, this one's a little hard, termites. Don't get upset, paddles. I did the research and dumbed it down. Okay, so the trader termites in Michigan that they arrested, the militia, right? They were going to extradite her. My favorite. I say it every week, but I just can't believe they had a plan to extradite her to Wisconsin. (laughs) Absolutely not. I'm from Michigan. I'm not a Wisconsin (laughs) gal. Why would you take me to Wisconsin? I mean, I like to visit, but I don't want to be held captured, be yeah, prisoner. I love to be captured the FBI, bad, 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 some bad termites. The FBI got walloped last week when a Michigan jury con- uh, concluded that the Bureau had entrapped two men accused of plotting to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Uh-oh. Those men and others were arrested a few weeks before the 2020 election in a high-profile FBI-fabricated case. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. They inf- infiltrated they were just your regular dummy dums in their vacuum store, basement, repair shop, whatever, talking about stuff. But when the FBI people, this is where I dumbed it down, you don't have to read all this, they were the ones that concocted the plans of kidnapping her and surveilling her house. Those guys just went along with it. Well, that's entrapment. You can't do that. Totally. And they're going to get off. And they should. Even though I still think, you know, there's a lot going on with these guys. I mean, when you, yeah. Anyway, that's just a little update because sometimes, sometimes the trader termites did not do it. These guys were entrapped. Also, though, you still are going along. I mean, how cray cray are you that you're still going to go along? Even if somebody suggested I do it, I'm not doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was afraid I was going to get in trouble for being out in front of Warren Buffett's house for like five old minutes filming a video. You did look kind of nervous. I was nervous. I mean, he's probably got security I don't even see. He has to. He's worth $125 billion. I should have brought him an egg. Lure him out of the house with an egg McMuffin. Yep. The house looked kind of dark. I felt kind of sad for it. Mm-hmm. But he's an old turtle. He probably doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Or notice. Mm-hmm. Um, update! <laughs> I love this. I love this. I get so excited. Me and, my, me and my brother are all over this yacht thing. I, like, I don't even want a yacht. Somebody offered me some Twitter, uh, ter- Twitter term. I, they know somebody who does clean one giant yachts and like we could go take a little tour of it. Oh, yeah. yeah i'm not gonna do it because i feel like well you, know, you shouldn't probably be doing that but um germany seizes the world's largest yacht at least according to volume wow. this is crazy 
They've seized, seized the world's largest yacht um, by volume after determining that a Russian oligarch had transferred its ownerships to his sister, who's also facing, yep. So, you know, Dilbar, the yacht in question, <laughs> measures some 511 feet, 15, well, almost 16,000 tons, which shipbuilder Larson says makes the largest motor yacht in the world by gross tonnage. It has two helipads, one of the biggest indoor pools ever installed on a yacht, and according to the U.S. Treasury Department, puts its estimated worth between 600 and 735 million. Are there any wow. yacht termites? Are there any yachting termites? I want to know how much it costs to fill this up. What I mean, ten grand. What's it cost when we stop for a little, when we want to get gas and a six pack of Bud Light? Anybody have <laughs> anybody? Can you imagine getting off the yacht and going, how yeah. Is, how much is ice? <laughs> we need three bags of ice. Um, oh, we forgot sunblock. Ah, uh, any kind. Banana boat's great. Um, and just fill her up. The super yacht named after the original, after the mother of its original owner, Alisher Yuzminov, one of Russia's wealthiest billionaires and a known close associate of the president, Putin. He was sanctioned by the U.S., United Kingdom, so on and so forth. Germany's federal police tweeted Wednesday that it found through extensive investigations despite offshore concealment. This is the part my dad's saying. It's, it's so hard to find out who actually owns this stuff. Because they just keep putting it in company after company, or then they give it to a cousin or a whomever. Uh, authorities impounded the yacht, which remains in the port of Hamburg, after confirming with Brussels that its owner is under sanctions. So they've sanctioned all these individuals. Um, yeah. The owner of the yacht. Uh, that's that guy. He's been also been linked to luxury real estate in it, Italy, Latvia, blah, blah, blah. That ship made headlines in March when Hamburg officials denied conflicting reports that they had seized the super yacht and said any such mood would have to come from higher federal customs authority. Well, they did it. It's the fourth longest in the world. Right. It, can op- it can accommodate 96 crew members as well as 24 guests in a large living space, which includes fold-out balconies, an onboard garden, a specifically developed variety of grass that tolerates salt air, oh. and more than a 1,000 custom-made sofa cushions. Could you imagine putting your order in at front gate? <laughs> like I've ordered, I've ordered outdoor cushions for furniture and stuff, and that shit is not cheap. No. Even the cheap stuff ain't cheap, cheap. Um, they need a thousand. Oh my God, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. But good for them. And I got one more, one more seizure. Hold on, let me put that paper clip back on. So paddles can do the show notes, and I just don't throw a giant stack of papers. Oh, my God. This is crazy. Update. Lame update. Again. No, I've done Again. good ones. No, France seizes, seizes Roman Abramovic. 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 Roman Abramovic's 98 million luxury chateau. Amid the crackdown on his 12 properties. I believe he's the one who owns the sporting team. The so- I think he owns one of the English. Um, Probably. Uh, his, his $98 million. What's his C- name? Roman. Mm-hmm. Uh, How did I just say it? Abramovic. Abramovic. Yeah. He's the governor of Chautauqua. Where's Chautauqua? It sounds like a Native American Chautauqua. name. Chautauqua. Chautauqua. Does it say that he owned a, cl- a foot, uh, soccer team and just yes. sold them? He owns Chelsea. He owns Chelsea. Did he sell them? Yeah. Oh. He's trying to cash oh. out. His nationality is Israeli, Portuguese, Russian, and Soviet. <laughs> His nationality. Oh, come He's on. He's got 18 passports. Yeah. <laughs> France's economy and finance minister said on Wednesday that it had seized a total of 33 properties, four yachts, six helicopters owned by sanctioned oligarchs per Le Parisien. The ministry referred Insider to a list of the frozen assets. There are 33 properties that have been frozen, including a dozen belonging to Roman, a French so-and-so from the said. One of the properties, this is so crazy, is Chateau de la Croix, which is owned by him and located in the city of Cap d'Antibes, a resort town between Cannes and Nice on the French Riviera. 
The billionaire spent around 100 million euros, that would be $109 million, to restore the luxury villa Le Parisien reported. It's estimated to be worth about $98 million. Whoa. And boost a 15-meter swimming pool on the roof, a gym, and a cinema in the basement. Well, you know, Ron's house had a, quote, cinema, a pool outside, mm-hmm. not on the roof, and what else? A gym. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It was built in the 20s. Mm-hmm. The chateau was reportedly rented out by UK King Edward VIII before the Second War. All of the assets that France seized recently add up to more than $27 million, the French finance ministry said. Blah, blah. It's all part of the program of sanctions being brought against Russian Federation in response to its invasion of Ukraine. Great. See, I can't... I know people say, well, why doesn't somebody take Putin out? The question is, when are these oligarchs going to get fed up? Yeah. What are there, like 50 of them? Right. And if they have a little come-to-Jesus meeting and go, you know, nay-nay on... Pute, like you can't just start doing this shit. And now his bo- he had to sell his team, his houses, his chateau. I'm sure he has a million other houses. I get it. But eventually you're going to be irritated, especially after you just renovated. <laughs> Come on, man. I just redid the bathroom. Uh, I got to go. Right. Come on. Yeah. Holy shit, they found it. We're moving on. It's all my updates. This, this is crazy. This is, t- this is an Easter present for somebody. It's, this is a holy shit they returned it, but I, I put it in, found it. Uh, a set of rare notebooks filled with notes by Charles Darwin who have been anonymously returned to the University of Cambridge over 20 years after they were initially reported missing. What? The two notebooks, one of which includes Darwin's famous 1837 Tree of Life sketch, holy oh, wow. shit, was returned to the university in March of 2020. They were left outside the librarian's office, wrapped in plastic, inside a pink gift bag and a brown envelope containing, containing the notebook's archive box and unsigned printed note. Librarian, comma, happy Easter, the note said. Wow. That's an honest librarian. Because you could have taken them, yeah. held on to them for a while, and then wow. sold them at all these pop-up bullshit auctions. So the precious bad. items, which you nervously believes could be worth millions, yeah, were discovered during a missing routine check in 20, January 2001 when it was revealed that the small box containing the notebooks had not been returned to its correct place in the university's special collections or strong rooms. Well, I think, like, I went to Trinity to see the Book of Kells, and when you're in those rooms, I do wonder who's in charge of all this. Like, and would you notice? Yeah. Like, True. how often are we getting Charles's notebooks out of the drawer? <laughs> you know? I mean, the Book of Kells is always out, but um, following an exhaustive search spanning years, the university officially declared the notebooks missing and likely stolen in November of 2020. At the time, the university issued a, glo- they issued a global call out to help find the books. My sense of relief of the notebook's safe return is profound and almost impossible to adequately express. Along with so many others across the world, I was heartbroken to learn of their loss and that my joy of the return is immense, Dr. Jessica Gardner, a Cambridge University librarian, said in a statement announcing the return. They may just be tiny, the size of postcards, but the notebook's impact on the history of science and their importance to the world-class collectors here cannot be overstated. I'm incredibly glad to hear the notebook's safe return. That's an awfully honest person. His first Tree of Life sketch was drawn in the summer of 1837, a year after he returned to England from his worldwide voyage on the HMS Beagle. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> there a cruise ship named Beagle back then? <laughs> Over two decades later, he would go on to publish the most seminal uh, book of his career on the origin of species, where he expanded his ideas of evolution. So, it's a happy ending for a happy librarian. And it's good enough that that person's a super nerd and wants to keep it for the world and not just go sell it to some rich person that'll just hoard it in a drawer. Lost that paper clip again. There it is. Mm. Holy shit, they found it! This is alarming. This is where sometimes me and science part ways. Well, every day me and science part ways. New part of the body found hiding in the lungs. People, what? how many bodies have we cut open? And we're still, what's that? We're still going, what the fuck? Was it a smoker? No. 
Scientists have discovered a brand new type of cell. It's a cell. But still, I thought we knew all this by now. Thought we had it covered. Inside the delicate branching passageways of the human lungs, a newfound cell plays a vital role in keeping the respiratory system functioning properly and could even inspire new treatments to reverse the effect of certain smoking, thank God, yeah. related diseases, according to a new study. The cells known as respiratory airway secretory cells are found in the tiny branching passages known as bronchioles, which are tipped with something. The teensy air sacs that exchange oxygen and carbon. It says teensy. I didn't make that up. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of that word. The new cells are similar to stem cells, black canvas cells that can differentiate into any other type of cell in the body, and they are capable of repairing damaged alveoli cells and transforming into new ones. Alveoli, lie, lie, like the bronchi. <laughs> That's crazy, though, that we're still fighting. Somebody is still going. What's that? <laughs> Thank God it's not me having to do it or we all be dead by 40. Uh, moving on. I I don't understand people. I'm going to I'm going to investigate this further cuz I I read it. I've read it 3 times. But I still don't understand what the point of this was. This is um dutchnews.netherlands. Customs officials find 300,000 baby eels in a suitcase, in suitcases at Schiffel. Schiffel, am I saying? Schiffel. Schiffel. Oh, there's no D. Schiffel. It's, uh, the airport. It's Amsterdam. Amsterdam's okay. airport. Three, I love what they're called. Baby eels are called elvers. Wow. <laughs> They've seized more than 300,000 elvers or baby eels in the luggage of three Malaysian nationals. Malaysia, let's just keep down the racket, okay? Yeah. You're losing airplanes. <laughs> you're flying illegal baby seals around the world. Let's just try to get your behavior in check just for a hot minute. The baby eels, weighing a combined of 105 kilos, were being shipped in eight identical large suitcases and were spotted during a stopover on the journey from Portugal to Malaysia. The suitcases attracted attention of the customs official who made the find. The eel is a protected species and exports are subject to strict controls. Three Malaysians, two men and one woman, have been arrested and are being held. In, I, this is what I don't understand. Are they to eat? Uh, I don't know. What else would you do? You, who wants a pet elver? Well, they get hungry and they raise them. Then they sell them for eat. To eat. To eat. Yeah. You raise the baby? Seems like a lot of, lot of God, goddamn work just to have a fish sandwich. It's for, oh, eel, for sushi. That makes sense. I never eat it. Yeah, eel sauce. Uh, Ron will eat it. I can't even look at it. <laughs> but you don't want to let these things getting in rivers, too. They'll tear up a river. Exactly. They've got to put them in the bathtub. The eel is a protected <laughs> species, and exports are subject to strict controls. Le oh, I already read that. Last month, millions of elvers, also known as glass eels, were released into the something lake in Zeeland in an effort to keep the eel numbers up. The eels found in the suitcases will now be released into Dutch waters. I don't know about all that. Does anybody really know what you're doing over there? I the EU banned the save, sale of baby eels outside its waters in 2010, but the substantial eel group organization estimates that, estimates that 23% of the European glass eels that float to the continent shores each year end up being trafficked to Asia. Oh, oh. so they're trafficking them in, uh, okay, to eat. Yes. Sushi. Oh, okay. Thank you. I couldn't figure out what you'd do with it. I I know. <laughs> <laughs> the authority sees two tons of glass eels with an estimated um, value of $6.2 million in the same period. Yeah, so I know why they're doing it for the money. It's good money. <laughs> yeah. oh my God. It's just such a crazy thing to go. You know what I'm going to do? It's like, <laughs> the, I understand the cheese thieves, the, the people put last week who stole the cheese because it's delicious. Yeah. And, you know, some people make better cheese. Wisconsin. If I'm going to go steal, I'm stealing from Wisconsin. They do it better than anybody around yeah. here. Yeah. Um, but baby eels? It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Uh, well, this isn't an update. It kind of is, though. It's the, it's the children. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I do admire their spunk. Generation Z and millennials are disrupting the workplace as they're choosing to be jobless. But here's the thing. If you're going to be choose to be jobless rather than work for a company they don't like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. 
I understand not work, not wanting to work for a company you don't like. However, when you say you're choosing to be jobless, then I want to know who is paying for your life. Right. They don't ever, nobody, at, this reporter didn't ask these, the children, right. well, if there's only one job left and you don't happen to like it and you're not going to take it, right. what are you doing? Who's buying your lattes? Mom. Generation Z and millennials are unique when it comes to man- to demanding work-life balance. They don't want to work just flexible hours and environments. They want to work for companies that align with their own per- personal beliefs and values. And that I thought, aside from comedy, the longest I ever worked somewhere was Stuart Anderson's Black Angus Cattle Company in St. Louis. It's a restaurant. And then I thought, did my values align with Stuart Anderson's Black Angus Cattle Company? Something I never would have asked myself. What I did ask myself is, can I make an ass load of money up there if I wait tables and bartend? And the answer was yes. And then I thought about it. It did align with my values. I love a good steak. It was a nice restaurant. We had a band in the bar. What more do you want? It fits right into my belief. Almost half of Generation Z millennials would rather be unemployed than unhappy at a new job. Oh my God. A majority of them put their personal happiness <laughs> above everything, over work. The work model global study was conducted. Blah, blah, blah. The career goals of Gen Z and millennials are changing with the power dynamics in the work. Our findings should serve as a wake-up call for employers. There's a clear power shift underway as people rethink priorities. Here's what I like about the kids. They've realized if they all do it, whatever they want changed will have to happen. We just went along with everything because we didn't even know we had choices. I'm like, I don't know. I got to make money. I'll go wait tables. That, that seems like instant cash. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know who's paying for their life. So many, are there any, can anybody out there can answer that? Almost two in four members of the younger generation would prefer being unemployed than work in a job they don't like. Oh <laughs> Most God. of the young people surveyed said they preferred to work at companies that share their personal values. Two in five said they'd take a lower paying salary if it meant they were purposely contributing to society. That's nice. Yeah. That's another thing that's never entered my mind no. when I went to, you know, Maybe I'll go to open mic night and try that. I never thought, <laughs> am I contributing to society? More, you know what I was thinking? Do I get two free beers if I do this? Exactly. The answer was yes. Yeah, we're good. Diversity and inclusion were also important, survey respondents. 49% of Gen Z and 46% of millennials said they wouldn't work for a company that didn't make diversity a priority. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. They also said they'd quit their job if it, if it interfered with their personal lives. Of course they would. <laughs> the study's finding could offer an explanation as why employers are finding it difficult to attract younger talent for job openings. Ransay concluded that if employers don't start tailoring positions to fit the demands of the Gen Zers and Millennials, they could face an employment shortage. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The children won't come. Yeah. Give them what they want. Who cares? As long as they do the work. Mm-hmm. I don't care where they do it. I don't care how you did it. What time of day they do it. Nope. Mm-hmm. Nope. They want to bring their whole selves to work, which is reflected in their determination not to compromise on their personal values when choosing the employer. But here's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of businesses out there that are going to need a lot of employees that maybe nobody agrees with it. Yeah. Yeah. Then what? They need to rethink their approach to attracting and retaining staff or face serious competition. (laughs) I say go for the children. You tell them what you will and won't do. See if they'll do it. Never occurred to me. I was like, what do I got to do? And then they told <laughs> yeah. me what I got to do. I'm like, all right, I'll, d- I'll do it. Good, I'll do it. This is um, hilarious. <laughs> okay. This is uh, another one of the, I can't say it's one of the children, but she looks like one of the children. Mm-hmm. A protester interrupts the Timberwolves Clippers, that's NBA for mm-hmm. you people who don't follow sports, play she interrupted the game after gluing herself to the court, to the floor. Glued. glued. <laughs> Listen, I've had Gorilla people Glue. People are fucking People are losing it. I mean, I have gotten Gorilla Glue on my fingers trying to fix <laughs> eyeglasses, and that shit is no joke. So I hope it wasn't Gorilla Glue for her sake, or her skin will be ripped off and left on that court. Yep. A fan at the Target Center on Tuesday night interrupted the Minnesota Timberwolves play <clears throat> playing the game against the Clippers with an un- attempted on-court protest. Though the protesters used a new method to try and get her message across, it didn't stick very well. <laughs> get it? <laughs> Thanks. This writer will be here all week. In the second quarter of the play, um, 
in Minneapolis. While a free throw was happening at the other end, officials quickly halted the game after the protester ran onto the floor and apparently started trying to glue herself to the court. Wow. Arena security quickly grabbed the woman and got her off the court and cleaned the area. The TNT crew calling the game wasn't sure what had happened, as, there, as that's a rather unique form of protest. Uh, Allie LaForce, however, was told that the woman actually tried to glue her wrist to the floor and refused to leave initially. The glue was quickly wiped off the guard and the game resumed. She was apparently an animal rights protester who was trying to make a point, uh, to make a, trying to make a statement related to the Timberwolves majority owner, Glenn Taylor's chicken farm. I'll have to do more research. That's all I had. But I just, this is, I mean, who would even, that's so dangerous. What kind of glue? I mean, if it's Elmer's, you're not going to stick. If you need, right, I'll find out. I'll set that aside so I do more work on that. We'll see what happens. What do you get? How much trouble do you get in for that? Yeah. This is big news. You're banned from seeing the Timberwolves. I don't think she cares. (laughs) Are the Timberwolves even any good? They're not even good. There's no update on Phil Mickelson, by the way, except he did submit his um, paperwork to play in the U.S. Open. But, yeah, we don't know. I don't know if he's going to show up or if he's taking time to fix the, quote, last 10 years of his life. We'll see. This is big news. Okay, you guys know I like Bitcoin for fun. Not paying put you. What I don't buy, I don't buy the NFTs. I don't. I don't get it. I think it's a fad. I don't think it's going to, I do think Bitcoin will last. I do not think the NFTs will last. That has been my, who wants to own a digital piece of art? I mean, it's just in your computer. Big whoop. You can't hang it on your wall. Well, I guess you could print it out and then frame that. That would take my parents like eight years. (laughs) (laughs) NFT of Jack Dorsey's first tweet struggles to sell well guess how much this is the difference of it uh the buyer of a non-fungible token nft of twitter co-founder jack dorsey's first tweet says he may never sell it after receiving a series of low bids (laughs) malaysia based (laughs) sini estavi has been offered over just sixty two hundred dollars you know guess how much you paid for it 2.9 2.9 million dollars oh, he paid wow. and he's trying to sell it who's bothering me he's trying to sell it and so far it only got up to 6200 bucks the tweet which says just setting up my twitter but he didn't use all the letters was first first posted in march in 2006 and was auctioned off last year by mr dorsey for charity he bought the tweet in the form of an nft in march 2021 NFTs have been the t- have touted as the digital answer to collectibles. However, they have no tangible form of their own, and experts have warned about risk in the market. Yeah, I don't get it. No. Maybe I'm just an old turtle, and I don't get it, but I get Smart Bitcoin. Turtle. Last week, Mr. Estavi announced that the tweet had been up for sale on the NFT open marketplace OpenSea. Now, I thought about buying stock in OpenSea because they're the number one. I think they're the number one marketplace for NFTs, but that's to assume that shit's going to last. Right. I, just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. He's going to donate half the proceeds, which he's estimated to be. Um, he thought he was going to get $25 million or more. Well, you sure didn't, did you? Yeah. He said he met, never sell it now because he can't get a high bid. He said, uh, that's about it. But that just shows you he, he wants Elon Musk to buy it. Which, by the way, Elon Musk is in the big fight with Twitter. He wants to buy Twitter. And then... I did not know. Oh, I think I downloaded it. Wait, I got to see this because this is crazy. I didn't know who owned Twitter. Never gave it two thoughts. I've, I thought Jack Dorsey, and then I re, I know he's... Well, I printed it out. I, I took a screenshot of it. Hold on. I have to go through my Iowa videos. My Iowa videos. Maybe it was a screenshot. Hold, hold, hold. Hold. Oh, well, I got to talk about what we're watching, too. That reminded me because I took a screenshot of that. Um, Oh, there's Warren Buffett's address. Okay. So, Elon wants to buy Twitter. 
and he presented an offer. I forget what it was, forty-two billion, and it's a good offer. And there's going to come a point where maybe if he offers more, and they don't take it, he can do a hostile takeover. But the Saudis, they own a lot of Twitter. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh! And he stepped in and said, "Nay, nay." Elon's not doing this. Here's the biggest shareholders. The Vanguard Group, Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, State Street, Corp, Aristotle Capital Management, Fidelity Investments, Investments, Arc Investment, Clear Bridge Investments, and Geode Capital Management, and Barclays. That's the top 10. Wow. So the Saudis are Vanguard. Yes. I had to go do all this research. Mm-hmm. So in the fight between billionaires of who gets to own Twitter... As much as I do not understand Elon Musk, and I think he's an alien, as far as I know, he hasn't dextered anybody. Right. So I'm rooting for Elon. Pro-Elon. I'm pro-Elon. Although I like the way Twitter is, and I hope he doesn't mess it up, but <laughs> if that's what we're fighting about. Right. And then I did not even talk about what we're watching, but I watched... It's up front. Shit, I lost a pit. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. Um, there is a three-part documentary about Hillsong... The church. Oh, yeah. I never even heard of it. Because uh, Justin Biebs. Yeah, the Biebs was in it. Yeah, okay, B- in Bono it. had something to do with it. The yeah. one in L.A. Mm-hmm. They're all over the world. It started in Australia. In kind of fascinating. Um, but as soon as I see one of these things, I think as a Catholic, you know, and I mean, I Christmas and Easter, I don't go to Mass unless, it, you know, big holidays, whatever, but. I did. I think I went to mass enough in grade school to make up for the fact that I should never have to go to mass again in my life. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever class you were. That's a lot of mass. Um, uh, if I walked into a place like this, no. I would immediately go, no. You can't be jumping up and down and big screens and everybody's in tor- oh, like hipster torn yeah. up jeans. And this guy that is the I've, Carl... Pastor Carl. If you could not look at that guy and tell you he was full of shit, it's the overacting, the high energy guy. The high energy people usually are high energy because they're not really saying anything. It's all a trick. It's an illusion. He's a performer. And I mean, I've seen comics like that. The more energy they have where it's over the top, it has to be over the top, not just a high energy person, but where they take it over the top and they're like, I just want to tell you. And it's all very animated. It's because you don't really have. I'm not a high energy person, I'm a medium. Medium. I'm a medium energy person who likes an afternoon <laughs> beer and <than> that. <laughs> but I can see if you were not raised with a religion, how you might walk into a Hillsong place and think it was cool. And the music is way, I mean, <laughs> I think I know three songs from Catholic school. We are one in the Christians. We are one in the Lord. We are one. They're very traditional, but I like me and Michael Palasek, the opening act, we were talking about it. I like that religion is hard. I like that it's somber. I like that it's contemplative, like go into church and shut up. And like Michael said, as kids, it's a great place to teach your kid how to just shut up and be still. And that is a skill you do need in life at times. Like I'm, not so saying the sense. Catholic Church obviously hasn't had all of its problems. I'm talking about how it's presented right. as a religion. Right. And this place, to me, all that was missing was shots and an open bar. I mean, but he is a, oh, he is a slime bucket, this Carl guy. And all these guys fell for it. I'm like, yeah. wow. And the leader over in Australia, it goes even deeper. His father was a full-on pedophile. And the son covered it up. Yep, it's something to watch. Oh, my God. I'm going to tell you. And then here's the other one I watched. Thankfully, this lady tweeted it because I forgot I even watched it. It was so bizarre. She tweeted to tell me to watch it. And I'm like, oh, my God, I just watched it. I'm going to say his name wrong now, and I watched the whole goddamn thing. Jimmy Seville, the British guy on Netflix, the documentary, he was like a combination oh of yeah, Dick yeah, Clark yeah, yeah. Yeah, meets yeah. Wolfman Jack meets he was the biggest DJ, like uh, Ryan Seacrest, but he was a little cr- raw. Cr- Jimmy Savile. Savile. A British, a British horror story. This guy was the world's, I mean, he, yeah. he was 
he was such a perv and he went after so many people and a year after year and he, he worked at like these insane asylums when he was off work. Who does that? Because he was, he was, he was abusing the girls. Well, apparently some boys too, but the whole country fell for it. The queen knighted him. There's pictures of him and princess Di. I mean, he was immensely, I'd have Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Yeah. I would have to have a British termite explain to me, did everybody in England not think there was something off? I mean, yeah. I, I just don't see how that passed. But it was a it was a long time ago. So back then, I guess people didn't question things like we do now. But it's something to see if you're bored and you want a documentary. All right, how am I doing on time? We have time for a nice little American story. <laughs> Duckies, the number one once beloved road trip staple, tries to make a comeback. Uh, now here's a problem for Stuckies. There's something that rhymes with Stuckies <laughs> called Bucky's <laughs> that is really dominating. Um, and loves I'm gonna read Larry's and- story though. Larry, Bielberg, this is a good uh, bedtime story. It's a good story, and I forgot a lot about it. I do, but I don't want to pay for music. Why don't, why don't you hum, why don't you hum? We learn how to play the acoustic guitar, and this is this is where we need the master's music in the background. No, don't hum, please. That's terrible, paddles. Yeah, I'm 45 miles away when a billbird appears. <laughs> famous pecan log rolls. That's what they were famous for. And pecan logs, they were so good. An American tradition since 1937. I press on the accelerator a little harder. The sales pitch steadily amps up. Saltwater taffy promises the next sign. I never could eat that right. A few miles later, a Godzilla-sized squirrel peers from another towering advertisement. I need to stop at Stuckey's to get my nuts. <clears throat> when the roadside shop finally appears on the horizon in uh, Mapsville on, the Virginia, on Virginia's eastern shore, there's really no choice but to pull over. I step inside Stuckey's even on a chilly winter day. It felt like a warm beach vacation with spitter racks of T-shirts, piles of Mexican blankets, and shelves and shelves and shelves of candy. Yeah. A lot of people who come here say they remember traveling with their grandparents during the summer and they always go and stop, said Jennifer Fletcher, who's worked at the counter for over 32 years. I nod knowingly. The truth is those memories had prompted me to detour out of my way to visit the last free stuck, standing stuckies in Virginia. It traces its roots to a Georgia pecan dealer who started the stand to sell nuts, sell nut candies made by his wife. As the country emerged from the Depression, Sylvester Stucky Sr. began to build stores, and soon it was outfitted with gas pumps, lunch counters, and gift shops. His newly founded chain with signature blue roof grew along with the country's new interstate highway system, reaching 368 locations in more than 30 states with a concentration in the South and the Southwest. For baby boomers, it became a road trip staple, an oasis of souvenirs, sweets, and plus clean restrooms. Big seller. Nice. Yeah, I wonder if the people out West, I don't know if they ever made it that far. It was sold a couple of times to conglomerates, began a downward spiral after the oil embargo of the 70s, temporarily put the road trip out of fashion, and fast food challengers sprouted up along the way. Now it's trying to make a comeback. Um, I had fallen anew under the Stucky spell a few months after early a visit in Atlanta when I stayed at a Stucky's-themed Airbnb furnished with brightly branded oh, coffee mugs. Fun. Right? Vintage candy boxes and even a rubber alligator. One of the stores, Trevor, Su- yeah, they sold them. That was one of their souvenirs. I loved it as a kid. They had all kinds of animal things. They all brought back memories of childhood wow. trips across Virginia with Stucky's stops in Front Royal Williamsburg and points beyond. The guest house belonged to Stephanie Stucky, the grand- founder's granddaughter, who recently oh. bought the financially troubled company. I felt if I was sleeping on sacred ground or at least in the shadow of royalty. Stucky, 56, laughs at the idea, although the Atlanta Journal-Constitution did call her pul- call her a pecan log roll heiress, oh. a title that seems to mo- amuse and annoy her. I thought heiresses were supposed to have money, she said. I got debt. Uh, I got debt? Yeah, but oh. I'm going to skip some of it. But he had really good um, marketing ideas. Um, well, they have online stuff, yeah, but here's what he would do. That's cool. Um, the chain was also an expected beacon of tolerance in the Jim Crow South, welcoming black travelers as a company policy. It makes even makes an appearance in the film Green Book, 
when the white driver Tony Lip Vallalonga and his client, black musician Don Shirley, share burgers in South Carolina sipping soda from Canary Yellow Stucky's papers with a blue roof store behind them. They were relentless advertisers. Listen how smart this guy was. 4,000 billboards at its peak. It wore down parents' defenses, defenses with an onslaught of signs alerting everyone in the car that Stuckies was ahead. That's what, that's what gets you. Bucky's does it too. Bucky's yeah. six miles ahead. And then kids, kids see a giant beaver, yeah. and then they're like, we're going. And you, can't, you can't avoid it as a parent. You can't go on. I hope they didn't see that. The company would um, t- t- typically locate stores on the northbound side of the road, Knowing that the southbound vacationers were so eager to reach their destination, they were less likely to stop. Now I'm going to think about that every time I drive south. Yeah. Where is it? Is it on the northbound route? I know the Bucky's from Nashville to Atlanta is on in Chattanooga, the one outside of Chattanooga. It's, it's on the northbound yeah. side. Wow. Yeah, who knew? Um, he also sought out hill-type sat- sites, her grandpa, so that they could be seen from a distance. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, let's let's root for Stuckies. I would love a gas station competition, Stuckies and Buckies. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how long your trip is, you can stop at both. Wouldn't that be a full day on the road? How fun would that be? I have a couple quotes. I'm going to round this out, termites. Well, first, well, you know where I'm going. Oh, my God, I'm going everywhere. You could go to the website. We added Colorado Springs for the fall, which is exciting. Um yeah. There's so many. So, so many is right. I got them all. Ridgefield, that's sold out. Wilmington, Delaware, the Grand. I always have fun there. Santa Barbara, Thousand Oaks. Alabama, come on out to Huntsville, the club. It's a tiny club, and the food is great. At least the last time I was there. Yeah, sometimes comedy club food, maybe not the best. This place, God, they had like a shrimp and grits or something. I couldn't believe that was made in a comedy club. It was very good. Um, anyway, so you guys can find me out on the road, termites, Denver. if you want. Denver, June 4th for the taping. Those shows are sold out, but I'm very excited. Yeah, I got to find some sort of outfit. <laughs> How about Salina? Uh, Salina, me and Sean Cassidy. How much fun Come on, yeah. Kansas people. Yeah. Come on out on a summer night and hear the do run run. I'll be going first. And Atlantic City. Atlantic City, when is that? June 11th. June 11th. The Bor- yeah, the Borgata. Focus. Fuck, I can't focus. I yeah. can't even, I can't even, don't even have time to unpack a pack. I'm just leaving the same shit. <laughs> wow. I mean, I care. I have an Andy Warhol t-shirt that has his cow painting on it, and oh. I save it for Iowa. It's to honor thing? them. Yes. Because they're cow farm. A lot of them are cow farmers. There were, there were, there were some, uh, some overalls that were actually. There were overalls, Yeah. Yeah, well, you can't, t- you know, sometimes, sometimes me and my parents go gambling at a casino in Boonville, Missouri. Uh-huh. And the one time I brought, uh, Patrick came and we were at the, the there were these, all these, because Boonville's kind of in the middle, named after Daniel Boone. Yes, in case you were wondering, uh-huh. everything in, like everything in Missouri is named after uh-huh. Daniel Boone. He was only traveling through, just saying. I think he died. There. <laughs> he died there, though. But anyway, um, there's all there's a lot of farmers. We're we're in the middle of nowhere, mid, mid Missouri. Lots of farmers mm-hmm. and these old guys at the craps table. They're in their overalls, but they have on a John Deere hat. And I said to my brother, I go look at their John Deere hats. I go, they're not trying to be hip. That's the hat they got when they bought their tractor. <laughs> <laughs> that was a free hat, and God damn it, they're gonna wear it no matter how filthy it gets because it was free. And a lot of the farmers are conservative with the dollar. Um, here's a quote by actresses, Fran- a- activist Francis Lear, quoted in the Washington Post. I believe the second half of one's life is meant to be better than the first half. The first half is finding out how you do it. The second half is enjoying it. Couldn't agree more. So much easier once you get your shit together. But then when you don't have your shit together, you really don't know it. So, doesn't really matter. But um, This is deep. Elena... Rants, quoted in The Guardian. We fabricate fictions not so that the false will seem more true, but to tell the most unspeakable truth with absolute faithfulness. Ooh. Dark. That's it, Thomas. It's a dark quote, but, you know, 
Yeah, you want something happier? You think of your pa- This is from James Baldwin, quoted in the New Straits Times, Malaysia. You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. See? So stop your crying. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Stop your crying, and, uh, you know, if you're one of the children, don't take a job you don't like. Yeah. It's not bad advice. All these employers better get their shit together, though, because these sure. kids are working as a group without even knowing it. They're not unionized. Uh, no. They're just like, uh, <laughs> that should be the name. Their union. They should unionize and call their union Yano. <laughs> Yano. So do you think you could come here Monday through Friday? Yeah, no. Do you think you could work eight hours a day in the same cubicle? Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> how do you even negotiate with that? You don't. It's just a flat out, how yeah. about, yeah, they don't come back with, how about I come Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Right. They just go, yeah, no. Yeah. Present me with another yeah. idea. But they're smart because you know what? Um, they're going to have to, the old people, all people my age that are the bosses, they're going to have to do what the children want or they're not going to have any workers. Go for them. Go for you. As our friend Rocky Laporte, the comedian from Chicago, would say, go for you. Go for you, kid. Go for you. We're going to bake that cake. Um, you'll have to bake it. I can't bake it. Duncan Hines. She went with Duncan Hines. Good choice. Yeah. Yep. American That's pretty easy. There it is on the side. All right, termites. That's it. I will see you out on the road, or I will not see you out on the road. I will see you, um, gosh, everywhere, and be good termites. But you're spring termites. Spring termites. It's still not fucking spring. It's still goddamn cold. It's cold everywhere. 42 degrees. Mm-hmm. Windy. But then I don't feel so bad about not being able to be home and go fishing because nobody's fish. fishing yet. It's too cold. There's like four fishermen I see in the cove, and I think they're just escaping something. They're not catching any fish, I can tell you that. But God damn it, it's an excuse to leave whatever situation they're in that they do not like. Where have you always wanted to fish? Where have I always wanted to fish? Yeah. Maybe the ocean has a little bit. I've always wanted to see the lakes in Minnesota, and I never have because I read the license plate. It says 10,000 lakes. I'm always in some city, and I don't see a lake. I know they have them. I know they're not lying. Minnesota termites, that'd be fun. Canadian I don't need the Canadian termites. Yeah, I like bass fishing. I don't need giant fish, and I don't. Saltwater fishing confuses me. I don't really get it. Brackish waters, sure. Yeah. Freshwater, freshwater person. Okay. Freshwater fishing. Um, yeah. Pike are supposed to be super fun. I caught one in Ireland once. Big fighters, but they also got teeth. That I think I don't want to take that off a hook. I, I cut the line and just threw the whole goddamn thing back. A lot of pike in Canada. Pike in Canada, yeah. My brother-in-law and my nephew are going up there on a little fishing trip with a bunch of guys. Driving all the way from Missouri. How else would you get there? Well, you could get there, but you couldn't have your boat. You could, you could fly, but you're not going to have your boat, your stuff. And my brother-in-law is a gear guy. He has a lot of gear. And it's all very well organized. You can't afford to check all that shit. No. No. And he's not going to be, what about you? What do we want to do, Kathleen? You want to rent, rent a fishing pole? Who's ever done? No. I'm driving. I'm driving. I'm like, oh, let's see. Driving right up into Canada. All right, termites, that's it. Be springtime termites and night-night termites. Bye. 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 Bye.